Good afternoon, colleagues. It's um, a real pleasure to welcome you all to the International Peace Institute for this timely event on a necessary voice, small states, international law, and the UN Security Council. We are honored to co-host this event with the permanent mission of Estonia to the United Nations. I'm also very pleased to see among the audience representatives from small states countries. We're excited to see this topic has sparked interest and attention. Today's discussion will focus on why the voices of small states, why are they so necessary at this time of rising geopolitical tensions? Why are they a necessary voice in the Security Council and as champions of international law? As you know, the UN was founded when the tragedy of Second World War was still a vivid memory in people's minds. It was then and only then that all countries gave up a little piece of their sovereignty to form the United Nations. And it was a necessary condition for the P5 to accept the UN to have the veto. It was a trade-off. So even though all countries are sovereign and equal under the UN, there's also an unequal nature and an unequal balance within the Security Council. However, over the last 74 years, the UN has benefited tremendously from the leadership of small states. As this report highlights, Look, uh, many small states have played bridge building roles and leadership roles when the P5 have been um, amid terrible and, and difficult circumstances that the, the elected members have played very important roles. And I'm really glad that I have Uruguay here who serve at the council just recently and they played a key role in the protection of civilians as well as in uh, uh, highlighting a, different nature of, of peacekeeping operations. So it is really great that we have someone that has a first-hand experience in the Security Council. Um, also, the, the report here in the panel will also talk about the relevance of small states in protecting international law. And as, as we have all seen, we're living a moment where international law is a threat. It's often being ignored or manipulated. Why? Why are small states the champions of international law? The former president of Estonia said international law is our nuclear weapon. It's really the best form we have against the, the evils of power and domination. So uh, these are some of the questions that our panelists will answer. And we are very excited to have such esteemed guests. We will, we will uh, each of them will have about seven uh, minutes to, to provide some answers to these questions, and then we will have time for a Q&A session. Our first speaker is Mr. Gert Auvart, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Mission of Estonia. Gert, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, first of all, let me thank IPI for organizing today's event uh, and uh, all of you for attending. Without you, it wouldn't be an event. Uh, we, small states, and I will use this a lot, I'm coming from a nation of 1.3 million people, are first of all very happy to have IPI, an institution as such. Um, uh, one thing, it's straight across the road from the UN, very convenient. Secondly, uh, it helps to, to voice and echo a lot of concerns in, in a setting uh, other than the windowless uh, conference rooms of the UN Secretariat or conference building. Uh, and draw attention to some of the key issues uh, and uh, disseminate it uh, at a wider wider setting. Uh, it is uh, it is an honor for me to be here today, and it is a real honor that uh, that we have a scholar, a professor, Professor Lauri Melkso, sitting uh, on this panel with me, who, together with uh, Adam Lupel from the IPI, have uh, created and drafted this report that uh, all of you have in front of you. A few months ago, when I uh, first acquainted myself with the draft version of this, I uh, uh, had, uh, had the opportunity to read and study, and, and, uh, and, and it is an interesting read, and, and definitely should create lots of, uh, lots of ideas and questions in, in your mind. I mean, for us, for, for Estonia, this, uh, this year particularly, we, we, uh, uh, we, feel, we feel the pressure in this regard 
since in 2005, we set up a bid for a non-permanent seat at the uh, UN Security Council. And those of you who know how the how the UN elections work, I mean, these things are are uh, you you sort of uh, let know of your interest well in advance. And this uh, notion of well in advance over the years it has stretched considerably. So. So now, last time we did it, we, we could do it 15 years in advance. Now, if we were to think of it again, it's already a timeline of 25 years or so. The interest to serve on the council is great. Uh, and uh, we firmly believe uh, in, the, in the headline of today's discussion that the, the, the voice of small states in there and also particularly the small island developing states uh, is uh, essential to, to carry their message through, not only at the GA where everyone has a voice, where every voice is equal, but also at this uh, sort of elite club with the five permanent and ten elected members addressing the most uh, imminent pertinent questions of international peace and security. We, we see that uh, we small states, uh, for us, uh, you quoted very eloquently my, my previous president on, uh, on, on what, we, what we believe about international law, but for, for us international law as such, it is, uh, it is an existential issue. A rules-based multilateral world order is not a comfort zone for us to look at. It is, uh, <laughs> it is a security concern. It is, uh, we base our whole existence on international law. And uh, you don't have to look back too far in history to understand why or where my, where my sort of argumentation in this uh, comes from. Uh, and uh, for, for us, uh, multilateralism is a value in itself. My, my PR has, uh, and my, my president and, and my ministers have uh, on several occasions uh, voiced out the same same sentence, I'll say once again, multilateralism is a value in itself. Uh, and, and we believe in it, and we believe this helps uh, move us all towards a more sort of uh, peaceful, uh, 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 peaceful uh, globe, peaceful uh, place to, to inhabit. And uh, what the web, what holds all this together in our eyes is international law. Uh, what can small states do at the UN Security Council? We, we can go in with fresh ideas. We can go in with, uh, with things that for us have been relevant for a long period, but might not be seen as such by, by some uh, more, let's say, global powerful players. And uh, I believe that the, it is essential, and, and uh, my, my uh, colleague Louise knows with this much better than I, since he has, uh, or his country has served in the council. We base our assessment on the hearsay and on the option to observe this from the red seats in the council, rather than uh, behind the horseshoe uh, uh, table itself, uh, is that we can uh, make a change, we can make a difference. Uh, and if you look at the last few years, you see that the elected members, the elected 10, have more and more been able to pool their resources together to uh, address issues close to their heart and, uh, and also consult uh, extensively with the P5 to bring uh, certain issues forward. So from Estonia's perspective, we are definitely not going in there blue-eyed and optimistic and thinking we will change the world. But if we will be able to change something small, something little, if we can a little bit more uh, echo uh, what is being said now by Germany and a few others that climate is a security issue, that it can be a root cause of conflicts. Uh, and uh, uh, on another aspect, I come from a highly digital society, a digitalized country. We believe that uh, some of the lessons we have learned in there are not uh, essentially uh, digital lessons because for us, this digital, it's a governance tool. It's not about technology, it's about good governance. And we believe that uh, also the working methods of the UN Security Council, uh, there are these small steps that can, can be achieved and we will definitely work very closely or try to work uh, 
as closely as possible with anyone who has ever ha held that portfolio at the UN, the working methods of the Security Council. And if we can hammer in a few little changes there, like, uh, for example, Estonia was able to do uh, with the ACT group accountability, coherence, transparency in the uh, selection process of the UN Secretary General, that there were actual hearings with the candidates. People could actually hear the views of the potential candidates, and then the selection was made. And I'm happy. I, I believe we have an excellent Secretary General of the UN. But the whole idea that... Uh, uh, that you would hear the candidates beforehand was unheard of uh, uh, five years ago. Similar things like this uh, along these veins, if there are some things that we could, uh, uh, some challenges that we could address in there, we would definitely work very closely hand in hand with the other elected members, but not only them, also the permanent members interested in, in bringing uh, more efficiency, more transparency to to the council's portfolio, but my seven minutes is up. I have so much more to say, but I'm <laughs> passing it. I'm sure there will be more in the Q&A session, but thank you so much for, for this statement. I, uh, listening to you and just um, that, that the rule-based order is not your comfort zone, but it is really a matter of, of, of peace and security. It's, it's, I think it's a very important reminder of why this event is and the report is so timely. Next, we turn to Latin America. Uh, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Uruguay is here. The, uh, he, was, uh, he served in the council, I think Uruguay was in the council 2016, 2017? Correct. And um, uh, we're happy to have you, thank you. You have the floor. <clears throat> Good afternoon, thank you, Jimena, for the introduction and moderating this session today. Uh, thank you to IPI uh, for thinking of Uruguay and inviting us to share uh, uh, in a few minutes uh, our experience during our tenure in the Security Council. And congratulations to uh, Professor Lowry and Adam Lupel for the uh, report that is uh, presented today. Uh, a necessary voice, I should add, uh, a timely and necessary report, so <laughs> congratulations. The fact that the, the role of small states at international level is limited because of their lack of physical capabilities definitely does not imply that through wise foreign policy they may not take an active part in decision-making issues of global concern. Although small states tend to have a deficit in autonomous foreign policy decision-making, there are possibilities to reduce such power disparities and strengthen their significance in the international fora, mainly through an active and systematic approach in international organizations or through the means of multilateral diplomacy. The role of small states in international organizations are particularly in the UN Security Council has been of major focus in recent years and its relevance increases. During this session, we will be able to analyze the space provided in the Council to non-permanent members in which they can maneuver and have the possibility to make an impact in global security issues. Even though major difficulties do exist when it comes to the elected members in the Council's decision-making in comparison to the P5, it is not to say that elected members, or E10 as usually named, cannot increase their voice in the Council and influence the international community. There is a substantial and considerable space for small states to play significant roles in the UN Security Council and in decision-making processes, where global security issues are discussed and approved, despite the claim that the Council is dominated by the P5. There are various issues that concern small states in international relations, including their foreign policy behavior, small states in alliance systems, partnerships, peacemaking, peace building, international economic relations, etc. According to Professor Alan Chung in a book titled The Diplomacy of Small States Between Vulnerability and Resilience, 
small states strive to increase their significance to the international community through an active approach of virtual enlargement, what he calls virtual enlargements. This means that they moderate the power of major actors through psychological tactics as human resources, intellectual and propagandistic skills, rather than the country's size or physical power capabilities. He was referring to mainly to Singapore. Mm -hmm. Professor Chong referred mainly to Singapore as, as a reference. The changes in the international environment significantly have affected the situation of small states in international relations in a positive way. This is not to say that the great powers' influences have diminished, but that small states are allowed or expected to act in a more autonomous and sovereign way in international relations than before through the means of multilateral diplomacy. I, leave, I believe that due to their continuous and consistent contribution, small states help multilateralism in this crucial moment when it needs to be strengthened. Of course, we regret reluctant stances, resignations, and withdrawals by powerful actors, but the multilateral wave and its dynamics have not slowed down. Collective decision-making and the possibility to make proposals that have an impact on the international system are consequences of equal positions to all countries in international organizations without regard to their physical capabilities, military or technological, for instance. In spite of having the privilege of the veto for the P5, the E10s have considerable space to make themselves visible and play a key role in the implementation of their proposals concerning crucial security issues. In this sense, UN Security Council Resolution 2286 is a clear example of what I just mentioned, which has also been extensively considered here at IPI on different occasions. In other words, coalition building, the specificity of the issue presented for negotiations, attitudes and abilities of the country's diplomacy, delegations, leadership skills, among others, are all factors that besides great powers may favor small states in their aim to strengthen their voice in the international environment. These are all parts of multilateral diplomacy that enable small states to take an active part in the network of international organizations and in so achieving more equal levels among states in terms of power imbalances in international relations. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I will move to the second concept uh, that is addressed or tackled by the report. Respect for international law and why small states try to support the existence of international organizations. The UN institutional framework offers small states a way to internationalize their views, attitudes, initiatives, proposals, which are in their national interest and are used to make the country more visible, being involved in decision-making processes. It would be reckless to affirm that the E10 are more respectful towards international law than P5 are. But as an asymmetry, as symmetry with individuals or human life, the more power you exercise, the more one tends to surpass boundaries or abuse this power. In other words, Small states are prone to behave or to conduct their foreign policies under the umbrella of international law. And why is that? Because international law is the best safeguard they have at their disposal to be respected and a shield to confront powerful states' abuses. Multilateralism and platforms like the UN provide small states the opportunity to play a role in global affairs 
and we have many examples of small states behind the initiatives of remarkable outcomes. Previous reports of IPI have addressed this issue. I, I, I will only mention two or three of them. The role of Costa Rica in the arms treaty, uh, tra arms trade, uh, trade treaty, Malta, Singapore, New Zealand at the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, Trinidad and Tobago with the creation of the International Criminal Court, and Switzerland and Liechtenstein in the emergence of the ATK group. To conclude, let me share with you uh, a few uh, features which I consider the main outcomes uh, of Uruguay, of the participation of Uruguay during 2016 and 2017 as an elected member of the Security Council. Our main um, participation and, and, and outcomes would uh, follow as this, human rights issues in conflicts, protection of civilians, and the um, planning and uh, adoption of resolution 2286 on uh, medical care in conflict. Human rights components in peace operations. Yesterday we have a very interesting session where human rights components of UNAMI, MINUSMA and MONUSCO uh, share their experience and the way they work. We believe that we have to stress this point to um, make, uh, promote the creation of uh, human rights components in all peacekeeping operations deployed by UN because where peace um, and stability are in conflicts uh, deserve or justify the deployment of a mission is because all these conflicts and tensions are accompanied by uh, a lack or a deficit in human rights at the at, at the at the at the these countries on the on the on on the spot. So we believe that we have to promote the uh, participation of uh, human rights components in all PKOs. Another important stance for Uruguay was the uh, Rohingya's um, crisis and displacement in Myanmar. Defense of international law, stubborn opposition to caveats in peace operation, promotion of accountability and referral of cases to the International Criminal Court, protection of children, children in armed conflict, and recently we have been, uh, we are members of the group of friends of reintegration of children. Advance of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. We co-chair with Sweden, the Security Council informal group, working group on uh, women, peace and security. We've been members of ACT group we have been working very comfortable in the improvement of working methods. You know that uh, we have another track that tries to uh, the UN Charter and UN Security Council reform, but this is a, we can say this is a slow track. We, we think that it's much more feasible to improve and to work in the working methods, uh, meanwhile, of the Security Council. So we have been working and we found uh, valuable uh, partners in this uh, task. Um, as members of the ACT group as well, we uh, we are or we accompany, we share the no veto initiative in line with the ACT group and Mexico and France. And uh, we are in favor of the increase of transparency and we promote it during our two year tenure, the UN security public sessions. Um, we favor the UN Security Council engagement in Colombia, peace agreement and transitional justice. We promoted as well civil society participation as speakers in UN Security Council debates. And in parallel of that, we chaired during four years the ECOSOC NGO committee. We has uh, quite uh, as a balance, we have a remarkable progress during these four years, 
that allow to uh, broadcast in the web TV all the, the sessions of the committee. So I would like, I would prefer to stop right now and uh, then we keep some uh, uh, concept for the Q&A. Thank you very much, Jimena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I think your, your statement really highlights that uh, small states can play a very big and expanded virtual, expan uh, virtual expansion, you mentioned, um, in the Security Council. And it, uh, it, so thank you so much. This was really um, very useful. Now we turn to the co-authors of the report. And we are following Estonia's example of being in the digital age. <laughs> so we encourage you to download the report. There's only a few copies in the room, uh, but, but it is online. Uh, first, we will hear from Dr. Adam Lupel, IPI's vice president and co-author of the report. Adam, you have the floor. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me uh, thank our partners at the Permanent Mission of Estonia. Uh, and uh, thank you, Gerrit and Luis, for your, your beginning remarks here to get us uh, started. And thanks to my co-author, Lori. Thank you, Jimena. And I'll, I'll thank Kristen, too, even though you haven't started yet. But thank you for your, your input on, the, on various versions of the report. So this, um, this project uh, fits into a longer stream work of, of IPIs on small states that IPIs have been engaged in on and off for the past five years, really. Um, Small states, which uh, in the UN are defined as, as countries with uh, less than or around uh, 10 million people, uh, form not only the majority of the UN member states, but also a key constituency for IPI. So we're always really uh, grateful to work in this, um, in this area. Over the past year, we've been specifically revisiting the question of small states um, on the Security Council through the specific lens of international law, and it might be worth while to say a few things of why, why this topic, why now. Um, we are doing this at a time when there is broad recognition that international law as the foundation of the multilateral system is under increasing pressure. Um, discussions of the challenge to global governance and the international rule-based order have, have indeed become common. They come up in conversations I know that I have all the time now. And this is something that has been developing for many years, but I think it seems to be entering a, a critical period. Uh, this has to do with the current geopolitical divisions that we're all uh, very aware of, the stepping back of the United States from its place as a champion of the multilateral system, repeated violations of international humanitarian law in armed conflicts uh, in Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, and elsewhere, and the resulting increased vulnerability of citizens, uh, civilians um, but also, it relates to the broader uh, phenomenon uh, that continues to unfold with uh, citizens turning to nationalist leaders skeptical of multilateral cooperation uh, in general. But I'm not going to focus my remarks on the diagnosis of the problem. I think we've, uh, there's been a lot of debate about that recently, a lot of discussion. Rather, what we ask in this project, in this paper, is what is at stake? in the weakening of the international rule best order? What is its potential impact on small states? And what is their role, what can be their role in paving the path forward, uh, in particular as elected members of the Security Council? At its most fundamental, international order seeks to limit the anarchical nature of global affairs in particular to establish a system of norms, agreed upon rules and institutions to regulate disputes among states and to set limits on the use of force, both uh, on when it may be used and how it may be used. Among UN member states, and we heard a bit about uh, this from our colleagues, um, there is a sense that small countries are most at risk if the international system further deteriorates into an older model of international order based on mere power politics and zero-sum games. It is, in some sense, a potentially an existential issue. Small states are, by definition, vulnerable in a world where international law is compromised and only might makes right. Um, while states of all sizes um, will strongly defend international law, when it is in their interests, small states tend to have fewer economic or military tools to rely on. And thus, one finds they place often a greater emphasis on international law in their foreign policy. 
In particular, we've seen that small states tend to highlight a commitment to international law when uh, running for the Security Council, as Sweden did leading up to their 2017-28 term, and, uh, and Estonia is currently. Thus, um, we must ask, uh, on a body like the Security Council, which we recognize is dominated by large, powerful states, the Permanent Five, can small states serve as effective champions of the rule-based order and international law, and if so, how? Um, I don't think it's, uh, it's uh, a spoiler to say we think they can. <laughs> um, but when asking what small states can do on the council to defend international order, we do need to recognize uh, some of the limitations first. Even the largest and uh, most powerful elected members of the council run up against the uneven nature of member state influence in the body. And I think it's important while many uh, people point to the veto as the critical determinant of power on the Security Council. Um, and I'd be interested to know what Luis feels about this, but what we heard in our interviews and such is that um, at the working level, it is actually often not so much the veto, but the element of permanence mm -hmm. that gives the P5 uh, their heightened influence. The permanent seat on the council allows the P5 to build up an institutional memory of relationships, working methods, and precedents that can be difficult for an elected member to master uh, in the short span of a two-year term. Permanent members also tend to have a much larger and well-resourced staff and diplomatic corps, which are difficult for small uh, elected members to match. Uh, however, small states can and do prove effective in a number of ways, as this litany from uh, Uruguay yeah. just uh, demonstrated. It's an incredible, incredible list. Um, numerous observers have noted that uh, one of the comparative advantages of small size is actually the ability to quickly maneuver in policy debates. Uh, it's important that, I mean, every foreign service is different. All small states are different in one way or the other, geopolitically or uh, uh, economically, military or otherwise. But small state diplomats often report uh, feeling less constrained by the large impersonal bureaucracies that make internal consultations slow and difficult. Small size also often tends to result in a more focused expertise among small states diplomatic corps. And uh, experience has found that small states that choose to strategically focus on a particular set of policy areas and cultivate recognized areas expertise have often found a path to success. Uh, this type of niche diplomacy where a member state champions a particular issue to move it forward in the system is behind some of the most significant advances in multilateral diplomacy. Luis mentioned a, a few of them, the Law of the Sea, establishment of the ICC, the 2013 Arms Trade Agreement, among others, are re representative of this phenomenon. Um, in fact, recent years have witnessed several cases where small states have driven debates on the Security Council defending international law and the rule-based order, in particular uh, international humanitarian law. Uh, for example, um, when we were conducting interviews for this study, Sweden's work taking for the humanitarian file in relation to Syria was uh, widely uh, praised. But uh, let me conclude by briefly focusing on uh, Security Council Resolution 2286, which uh, Luis mentioned on attacks on healthcare, uh, which Luis mentioned IPI has been following uh, closely through our work on humanitarian affairs. As, as many of you may recall, in 2014, 2015, the WHA, uh, WHO came out with a study which recorded 594 incidents of armed attacks on healthcare in 19 countries. Uh, and it determined that 62% of those were intentional. Um, this goes to the heart of international humanitarian law. The protection of the wounded and the provision of safe space for medical care goes back to the beginning of international humanitarian law in uh, the first Geneva Convention. So to undermine that norm is to call into question the very basis of international humanitarian law and perhaps the international rule-based order as a whole. So in early 2016, the small state of New Zealand initiated a discussion on a possible Security Council resolution to help reinforce that bedrock of IHL. 
by convening a multi-stakeholder roundtable at its UN mission. And soon, a draft resolution was being negotiated by five pen holders, including Uruguay. After extensive negotiations, the final resolution served to clearly remind member states that intentionally directed attacks on health facilities and medical workers during armed conflict are war crimes. From a uh, negotiation standpoint, the resolution was a tremendous success. It was adopted unanimously with 85 member states as co-sponsors. And if, um, if that's not an example of virtual enlargement, I don't know what is, 85 member states as co-sponsors uh, spearheaded by the bridge building diplomacy of two small states uh, in partnership with, uh, with many others. So while um, we should recognize that the tax on healthcare uh, do tragically continue, the resolution and the small state's diplomacy behind it makes an important statement about the need to reinforce normative commitments to international humanitarian law at a time when some uh, might have been questioning the international community's commitment to that law. So to conclude, how can small states help defend the international rule of law in the current context? There is no um, single formula. Uh, to do so. It will take a combination of law, diplomacy, normative commitments, innovative working methods, hard power and soft power by many actors. But I think the recent examples of the Syria humanitarian file uh, resolution and resolution 2286 among others demonstrate that small states have a very important role to play. And part of that is the insistence from the council and elsewhere, that um, what we are seeing in attacks on health care, uh, increasing humanitarian consequences for civilians in armed conflicts around the world is a violation of international law and long established norms and not a transformation of those norms into something else. And small states, as specially effective states who collectively make up the majority of UN member states and who would be particularly vulnerable in a world with a weakened system of international law are well positioned to provide that message, to be that voice, um, and to, as we refer to in the title of the report, to be that necessary voice on this very important issue. Thank you, Adam. I think that was a, a great kind of preview of the report. Uh, we're excited to read it. Now I turn to the other co-author, Laurie, uh, professor of international law at the University of Tartu. You have the floor. Thank you. And I would also like to thank both Adam and IPI as institution for this very uh, stimulating cooperation that we had in this project. International law. Well, the problem with international law is that nobody says that they dislike international law. There is no country who would say that, by the way, we, we are not so interested in or, you know, we, let's ignore it. Uh, usually, international law is this interesting instrument of tools where every, every country tends to find something that, that, uh, that helps to make them their case. So that is, that is one one aspect about it that um, some some people speak about fragmentation of international law. A recent very interesting and stimulating book by the Australian scholar Anthea Roberts asks, is international law international? Making the, the point that most of the understandings of international law in, in the Western world also tend to bring uh, most examples from the from the western western world and 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 while international law maybe has different understandings in places like like china and russia for example i i i have for the purposes of this paper and as a scholar uh, doing research and this i have been interested in the history of international law and and one to answer Adam's question, what is at stake? I think what is at stake for small states is that it could be it could be worse for us. It could be worse for small states um, because there have been different types of international law over over the history over different times, and some types or periods of international law have been more hegemonic than others. 
So this problem of how international law relates to small state, it's not states, it's not only something from the UN era, it, it is something that goes back at least a couple of centuries, if not more. And you have, for example, in the Congress of Vienna, 1815, great powers deciding the fate of, of small states. You have the issue comes up in a strong way in the, in the Hague conferences in 1899, 1907. And, and yes, when the foundations of United Nations were agreed upon, you know, how should big powerful nations and small states, how, how should they relate to each other in world order? This was one of the, one of the major issues that, that that had to be had to de, had to be decided, and the result, of course, was a compromise in in many ways, and and the very nature of the Security Council as as a body, as an organ of the United Nations, was in a way a, a feature of this um, of this um, compromise. I think what small states consider important, or what what they should consider important, is that when the foundational principles of the United Nations are all mentioned in Article 2 of the United Nations Charter, then, then this famous article starts with, with uh, sovereign equality of all member states. This is something that, that maybe when we look at the actual power, power imbalances in the world can, can be forgotten, but nevertheless it's in the United Nations Charter. And, and of course from, from, that, from the viewpoint of that principle there shouldn't even be a question whether small states should ever apply to membership in the Security Council. Of course they should. They are entitled to. It's because of the sovereign equality. They should all occasionally get this chance and, and rotate and, 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 and um, get to be part of it as well. Um, so small states do emphasize international law. That doesn't mean that international law is not important for, for big powers, but they sometimes they have different accents in understanding what the small state, uh, what this means to us. And of course, for the most, the most um, existential problem of international law for small states obviously is use of force, because this concerns their right to exist. No, no country is, 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 so to speak, interested in, in force being used against, that, against it. And, but this is the core norm of the United Nations Charter, Article 2, Paragraph 4, the general prohibition of the threat and use of force. So, so I guess uh, small states as a group, they have a very intimate and, and specific uh, feeling about this, this norm, because in some ways this helps this norm uh, helps to secure their their existence. This is one of the one of the lessons that was drawn from World War II that we don't uh, solve our problems uh, like in the jungle, but 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 through diplomacy. Uh, how does international law come up in the Security Council? So, if if uh, the main job of the Security Council, of course, is uh, is determining breaches of international peace and security, but this is also making constantly not just political judgments but 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 also basically operating with the tools of the charter being a major implementer of the of the united nations charter and these are also international law um, um, principles that are are constantly applied and of course scholars also point out that especially in the last um, two decades or so, uh, the Security Council has become legislatively active, that some of its resolutions are, are de facto uh, attempts to legislate for the international community. And then, as you, as you all know, the Security Council resolutions are, 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 are binding to member states, on, 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 uh, and, and therefore this is a very important power. And, and, and I'm not saying that this legislative activity happens every week or every year, but occasionally it does happen and it has follow-up mechanisms. So it's, 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 it's also maybe then necessary for the legitimacy of these kinds of, of measures to have basically more subjects of international law on, on, on board. And, you know, finally, in the very system of the United Nations Charter, so the Security Council would be, for example, the body that supervises the enforcement of the judgments of the International Court of Justice. Again, it doesn't do it every, every week, but occasionally it will have to do it. Again, it's a, it's a role in the context of, of, international, of international law. So, 
I guess my my bottom line is is that there is a kind of paradox in in small states wanting to become occasionally members of the Security Council because, of course, in the minds of the creators of the United Nations, uh, if you take the conferences that prepared the United Nations in 1944 and 1945, in their, in their mind, obviously, Security Council is more of a sort of great power place than, than the General Assembly, for instance. Uh, but but at the same time there is this interesting interesting aspect of legitimacy that that beside these five who have separate powers and everybody acknowledges and recognizes that they, there are those ten others that can be elected so apparently even 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 back then during this constitutional moment this was seen as a, as a, as important for legitimacy of the security council so I guess my interpretation of it is that it would be then in the 21st century further important that that um, even smaller countries and other countries who haven't been there would, would get a chance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurie. And also thank you for bringing uh, international law into a larger scope beyond the, the nascent history of the UN, as uh, former SG Das Hammarskjöld said, the UN is a very new experiment in, in, in humanity's history. So thank you so much. And also for mentioning that international law is constantly redefined and, and often not always at the benefit of small states, right? So thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Christine Boone, Associate Dean Professor of Law at Seton Hall. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Adam, and others at IPI. Uh, thank you also to the representatives from Estonia and Uruguay. It did not escape uh, my attention that I share the podium or the stage today with uh, two countries that have made their own mark on international law. Uruguay, of course, uh, was uh, the host for the Montevideo Convention, and all students of international law know that that's the doctrine that defines the requirements of statehood. Mm -hmm. And uh, Estonia, of course, uh, has uh, been instrumental in the Talon Manual, which deals with cybersecurity and cyber warfare. Uh, so my job today is to broaden the conversation and to put some different considerations on the table about how small states engage with the international legal system. And I'd like to do so by discussing three different issues. First, I'd like to highlight the relevance of the rules of procedure of the UN Security Council. And I agree wholeheartedly with the observation uh, in the report that one cannot speak of small states as a block or as holding shared positions, particularly on substantive or controversial issues such as the use of force, but I'm going to argue that there's some value for small states in uniting behind the Security Council's rules of procedure. The bottom line is that small states need to be active participants on the Security Council in order to make their weight felt. The second issue that I'll discuss is uh, to expand the conversation beyond small states on the Security Council to talk about small states and the Security Council, and I'll highlight a few provisions in the UN Charter that I think are particularly relevant to small states. And finally, I'll conclude with some, com with some comments on how small states can contribute to the formation of customary international law. So let me uh, note by way of introduction that the powers reserved to the permanent five on the Security Council are substantial. And one could argue that the interests of small states are not necessarily on the Security Council. One might be more inclined to look at the General Assembly or other organs where there's universal representation. Nonetheless, I think active participation by small states in international institutions has been crucial. In fact, it reminds me of the title of a recent book by the former UN permanent representative from Singapore, Professor uh, Jaka Kumar, be at the table or be on the menu, right? <laughs> Uh, their system has much to gain from the participation of small states, and small states have much to gain from the participation in the international system. Wide participation in, with rules that are perceived to be fair by all players, whether they're big or small, strong or weak, creates stability and legitimacy. Uh, and I would suggest that this goes beyond the Security Council. This is also relevant to the engagement of states in the international treaty system as a whole, and as claimants or respondents before international courts and tribunals. But let me return to my first point, small states and procedure. Um, the uh, small states don't necessarily have the same interests. And there, I think there's real difficulty in talking about them as a unit. However, one thing that small states can unite on is procedures. Indeed, indeed, any litigator knows that mastering procedures can have a substantial impact on the outcome of any given issue. 
And so for small states who are on the Security Council, I would suggest that understanding and using rules of procedure is extremely important to being an effective council member. And that small states should, in fact, try strategically to work together to develop unified positions on procedural questions, even if it's not in their immediate short-term interest. For example, as many of you in the room know, the Security Council has a unique chairperson agreement. The presidency rotates on a monthly basis, giving all Security Council members the ability to highlight whatever issues are relevant to the particular country in that given month. And the president has substantial discretion such as calling meetings of the Security Council when necessary. Article 27 of the Charter also notes that while substantive decisions are subject to the veto, procedural decisions are not. Therefore, many Security Council presidents have used procedural triggers in order to try and move agendas along or to stop uh, certain agendas from proceeding. So for example, presidents have delayed meetings. They have rejected agenda items. They have required states to share resolutions in advance. They have suspended meetings in order to conduct consultations. And um, they have used procedures to protect small states. Um, in this regard, I would note that the 2010 and 2017 notes by the President of the Security Council on working methods aim to show efforts to improve transparency and participation amongst all states, and I think that's very beneficial as a, as a general matter. My second point is small states and the Security Council. The UN system is based on sovereign equality, and it's no surprise that there's a way in which this is a legal fiction. However, I think it's too simple to suggest that small states have no power. International law is a system where norms and values are continually contested. And although the interests of small states are not always the same as those of big states, one obvious example is terrorism. That tends to be more important for big states than it is for small states. It's important to recognize that the drafters of the UN Charter did try to protect small states by ensuring they had the ability to influence the agenda. So Article 31 of the UN Charter, for example, states that any member of the United Nations, which is not a member of the Security Council, may participate without votes in the discussion of any question brought before the Security Council whenever um, the latter considers that the interests of the member are specially affected. An obvious example of this would be small states that are affected by climate change or rising sea levels. Rules 37 and 38 of the Security Council Rules of Procedure also envision that specially affected states can participate in Security Council discussions even while they're not members of the Security Council. Now, it shouldn't surprise you that the term specially affected states is open to some legal contestation and interpretation. However, in fact, the Security Council has interpreted this quite broadly. In addition, um, it's clear today that there's many incidents and situations that could, in fact, um, affect a number of different states. And so I think it's important to think that small states might, in fact, be able to make use of these rules of procedure and the articles of the Charter themselves in a very effective um, way. Um, for example, during the election period, there's been many small states who have uh, made uh, promises while running for elections on behalf of other small or specially affected states. During the agenda setting phase, they've used Article 35 of the UN Charter to bring certain situations to the Security Council's attention. During the consideration phase, a number of small states have um, um, required or requested consultation, and the Security Council itself has done this with regards to legislative resolutions such as 1540 and 1373. And in the implementation stage, small states are equally important. It's clear that all member states have an obligation to implement Security Council resolutions, but of sort, some, for some can't. And so in fact, I think it's quite important that the Security Council recognize when small states need certain technical assistance or um, support in order uh, to implement the resolutions so as to avert situations where states have failed to comply. And finally, I would highlight Article 50 of the UN Charter, which anticipates that certain decisions create special economic burdens, and it invites affected states to bring those matters to the Council. And there have been a couple of situations in when states have, in fact, brought those situations to the Council. So the final point that I wish to make involves the role of the small states and customary international law. Customary international law, of course, is one of the key sources of international law. And uh, it is based on opinio juris, the um, idea that there has to be a legal intent to an obligation, and also state practice. 
and all member states uh, contribute to the formation of custom. Uh, um, however, the ICJ has recognized in the North Sea Continental Shelf case that specially affected states can also affect custom. And here again, we could look at the role of small states. They do this through voting, through official statements and public fora, through diplomatic uh, correspondence, in court filings, and so forth. In my academic writings, I've taken the position that small states can also influence customary international law through the Security Council, because Security Council resolutions can be evidence of customary international law. However, what I saw is that states must go beyond the language of accountability when they participate in council debates or make official statements. When they believe, for an example, that act constitutes an illegal use of force or aggression, it's important to say that, not simply to try and use more general terms. In addition, presidential and press statements can have legal effects. Therefore, there's multiple instruments that small states can utilize in order to affect the formation and the norms of customary international law. So let me conclude by saying that the history of international law is replete with stories of how small states have profoundly affected the international legal order. It's a consent-based order. I think it's an order where the sum is bigger than the whole. And so it's not just about power. Um, and there are many instances in which small states, and indeed all states, need to be actively involved. And here's just um, a, a final list that I'll give that uh, Sir Daniel Bethlehem mentioned in his um, very impressive speech, The End of Geography. Shared spaces, issues to do with movement of peoples, challenges to animal and plant life outside of national jurisdictions, cyberspace, cross-boundary movements involving trade and finance, and threats by non-state actors, including terrorism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine, and thank you so much for broadening the conversation, as you mentioned, and uh, really also highlighting the role of small states and in the Security Council and uh, the Security Council. So I think that's an important distinction, and how small states have made a large impact against the odds, against the asymmetry of power and other aspects. So now we have. Uh, some time for a Q&A session. My, my fellow IPI colleagues are here with the microphones. We'll take a few questions and then we'll uh, bring it back to the panelists. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence Moss, New York City Bar Association. I wonder if the Estonians on the panel in particular could illustrate for us some of the pressures that small states might face on the Security Council. Because as the ambassador observed, on the one hand, it's a direct security concern of Estonia that the rules-based order be observed. I think that's referencing your eastern neighbor. On the other hand, if push ever came to shove on your eastern border, you're very dependent on the United States honoring its obligations under the Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. So I noted that Estonia voted for the resolution on Jerusalem in December when US Ambassador Nikki Haley famously said she was taking names. Did you receive pushback from the United States after that? What happens in 2020 if Estonia is on the Security Council, Israel proceeds to an ex part of the West Bank, you're there, you're facing these pressures, you're facing threats, you know, what, what and, and many other states will have that tension with the hegemonic P3 powers and their own abuses, and at the same time needing the protection of the support of those powers. We'll take a few more questions and we'll let our Estonia colleague think about <laughs> the meantime. So, John? Uh, first of all, thank you very much. I'm John Hirsch with IPI. I want to ask you about the penholder function, because to my knowledge, the penholders are the permanent members of the council, almost always, Britain, France, the United States. So do you think that there's a role for uh, smaller states to be a penholder on one, and that this could make a significant difference? And is there any example that you could offer up uh, right now? Thank you. We can take another question, or we can go to the panel. And I know that Adam also mentioned whether it was more than the veto, was it also the issue of the permanence of the P5 that gave them that comparative advantage? The fact the the, the institutional memory that they have by being there all the time. I think that the question was directed to Luis. So uh, who would like to go first? Estonia, Gert? Yeah. Thanks, and uh, excellent questions. I uh, start with the second one uh, on uh, uh, on penholdership. Perhaps uh, not directly about penholdership. Uh, Louis can address this better. But our view on this, uh, at the very least, is that uh, uh, there should be more coherence and more cooperation. Let's say between if. Uh, 
one of the E10 is the uh, is the chair of a certain sanctions committee, then to be consulted also on uh, more, uh, let's say, wider issues of, of that particular area or that particular region. So in that sense, at least have a very close cooperation with the pen holder, whoever that might be for, for the issue. But Louis will elaborate on this. On the first question, very difficult question. Thanks for that. Uh, the, the, the short answer would be that for a, for a small uh, nation, for a small state with uh, independent foreign policy every day is, uh, is threading uh, carefully on, on where you place your steps. And uh, I, I believe the best uh, option to look at how or where we stand uh, is look at the track record of the voting pattern at the GA and look at it at the wider uh, or a longer time period. I mean, we don't uh, have a, a foreign policy for uh, just for the two years to come on the Council. And we believe that a lot of issues on the Council are also not to be addressed for the time that you are there, that, but they are, uh, they are longer term. And w whichever way you can contribute to them is up is your sovereign political decision and and uh, where will we come to when we are at the council i don't have a crystal ball to to answer that question thanks thank you um yeah in fact regarding the uh, pen holdership this is a old demand and expectation that uh, coming from E10 uh, member states that it has increased and we P5 already know about our our expectation and the the the, the right to be as well uh, pen holders i believe on the on the short term on a short term basis uh, we 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 are leading uh, to a intermediate stage of the co pen holderships uh, to have one P5 and one E10 as uh, co-pen holders. This will be an intermediate situation. It will be uh, hard to pass from P5 pen holdership to complete or 100% E10. So this is an intermediate solution that I will be, is, is from the time in, is, is quite fair. And in uh, certain issues considered by the uh, Security Council is or already s starting and increasing in, 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 in importance and consideration. Thanks. Great. Yeah, just on the, on the pen holder issue, uh, uh, just to note, so 22, 2286 had five pen holders. In addition to uh, New Zealand and Uruguay, you had uh, Egypt, Japan, uh, and Spain. And I'm looking over there at Beatrice, who's like <laughs> who's deeply involved in that. Um, and so I think that there's a general there's a general understanding that uh, the P5 are a bit more open to E10 pen holder on some of the thematic issues. Uh, and the Security Council report has a good uh, a good report on that on the pen holder system. And this I think comes back to some of the questions and what are the opportunities on the rules of procedure um, and uh, and how uh, small states, uh, E10, can come together on, on some of these issues to help uh, increase uh, their influence um, on working methods and, and that nature. So I think it's a, it's a very live debate. Are there more questions from the audience? Yeah, please. Yeah, I have a question for, for yeah? Kristen. <laughs> Please, go ahead. Can I, can I, is it, is it uh, poor form to ask a question from the panel for one of, our, one of my panelists? Um, I'm interested, actually, uh, Professor Boone, uh, <laughs> if you could, you know, the, the, your points on, um, and we ta we've talked about this before, and so maybe this is part of a longer conversation, but your, your points on the relevance of rules uh, or um, uh, procedural decisions and then this position potentially of thinking about small states, especially affected states. I'm wondering, could you combine those two two thoughts a bit? And what is what what are there concrete strategies that can be taken to actually uh, improve access of small states that are not on the council through that uh, particular um, those particular articles that you mentioned? Let me uh, jump with another question yeah. as well, yeah. which uh, uh, the report. Um, talks that the small states have also moral authority. 
uh, and, and the panel has not um, mentioned this, but I think that is a fundamental question at this crucial moment. So can you also address this issue? Thank you. Thank you for those questions. So with regards to um, the first one, with regards to combining them, so the idea of specially um, affected states, I think, is more concretely defined in the context of customary international law. I mentioned the uh, North Sea Continental Shelf case, and in the ILC's recent conclusions on customary international law, there's also a reference to specially affected states. And so we see a definition in that context, which requires um, non-universal practice um, and also um, being distinctly affected by a practice. And so um, that might be a place to start. Uh, although I think it's probably more limited than what the Security Council has actually done in practice, right? So from, from, from what I've seen, anyway, from the outside, usually um, the Security Council um, has um, accepted requests by small states who claim to be specially affected, or indeed by any state. You know, it's not a condition that you be a small state to be specially affected in these circumstances. Um, so um, considerations um, have involved uh, geography and also when a state has been affected by discussions that are taking place in a different organ. That, so those are the criteria that I've seen so far. So um, given that the Security Council actually has fairly liberal practice in this regard, right, it would seem that one, um, any state could really take advantage of this in order to both suggest agenda items, but also to uh, be involved in the participation of, um, of the consultations and so forth. Of course, that doesn't give non-member states the right to vote. There's limitations to this, right? But even in informal sessions, I, my understanding is that sometimes um, specially affected states uh, have, uh, have been invited. So um, I think that you know the strategy here is to make use of both the article rules and the rules of procedure in order to um, insert oneself into the conversations and to um, try to develop the criteria through which one um, can uh, determine the statehood. With regards to uh, moral authority, I think um, the um, what I what I took away from that reference in the report um, and the way that that plays into my thinking of the international legal system is that um, there's a, a way in which we want to look at community-based interests. And I think you know small states and indeed all states are part of that conversation. And so um, the, um, important, uh, the importance to draw from that really has to go with um, the uh, cons consent-based order and the fact that states need to be seen to be comply with international law. So that would, that would be my perspective on that. Thank you. So now we're nearing the end of the event. I will just uh, give the floor for final remarks to the panelists. Gert? Uh, thanks a lot. And once again, thanks for, for uh, conducting this, uh, this event. And uh, when we ha held the small roundtable a few months ago to go over the draft, uh, we were hopeful, but uh, we have uh, almost 100 people in the room, lots of questions, and, and uh, very grateful for this. And uh, my suggestion to all of you is uh, take the report, study it uh, either online or in paper form, and uh, uh, I believe that uh, both professors are also ready to answer any questions you have at a later stage. And uh, for me, all I am at thinking of at the moment is what will happen on the 7th of June. Thank you. And we wish you all uh, the best of luck. Uh, Luis? Thank you, Jimena. Um, I would like just to, uh, before uh, concluding, um, add a, just an uh, additional note. Uh, uh, that is, is in interesting to share with the audience. Sometimes and in, in when we prepare to be a member of the Security Council, you have your uh, program of work, of course, uh, coordinated with uh, presidency and your ministry of foreign affairs and all the all the competent departments we could say this is the plan the planned uh, uh, program of work with pillars or priorities based on your uh, main foreign policy pillars uh, we were talking about this with uh, Lori before um, coming to the room but then we the dynamic of, of the work at the Security Council uh, make you face different situations that I should call uh, on the move uh, dynamic or on the move priorities that are connected with the proper dynamic of work of the Security Council. And this is when uh, uh, small states or E10 as well show uh, flexibility uh, in the way they uh, approach certain issues that arises from uh, from the spot, and they have 
any any precedent uh, in the in the past. So this is something that I like from the council. It's a nice dynamic. In the in the council, you uh, may um, think that you will work or you will uh, have a lot of. Uh, coincidences or agreement with certain uh, countries, but then when you are in the council, you meet or you know, for instance, in our first year was New Zealand, and in the second year was Sweden, countries that have a lot of affinities and similarities and common ground in the positions you expose at the at the at the session at the at the uh, UN Security Council chamber. So this is something that you cannot uh, uh, foresee before being a member and before starting to work. And there's another or a third stage that we could say, uh, this is, we could say about moral authority. I wouldn't say moral authority, it's moral satisfaction. It's a harvesting stage. When you are not a member of the Security Council anymore because you've been an E10 and uh, we can only be there for two years. For me, the ideal should be three years and then I, I will explain you why I think so. But okay, after our two years, we leave the Council and then you start receiving a lot of invitations to be a panelist or to co-sponsor <laughs> co -sponsor and an activity coming from the membership but from civil society as well. So this is an indicator that you have performed quite well, that you have been respectful of international law, you have been uh, a really correct uh, actor in, in uh, procedural issues. And um, I believe it's something very nice. It's a, it's a very positive dynamic that we are now experiencing after uh, leaving the council. Thank you very much. What about the three years? The three years is you can draw a, like a, a hill or a mountain. The first year is uh, learning. Your second year you feel strong, you know almost everything. So you should have a third year at your, your disposal to excel, to, to have the, the, the most important and they, and they have uh, the, 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 the strongest and more efficient performance. But we never have this third year. So when we feel that we know almost everything, we have to leave. Yeah. All right, thanks. As a former diplomat that served in the council, I wholeheartedly agree with that statement. Mm -hmm. Adam, you have the floor. Great, maybe, maybe for my uh, final reflections, uh, just, um, Maybe one connection between something that uh, uh, Laurie said and then this question about moral authority, or what I would say, uh, maybe we say moral authority, but also it's about, it's about the special legitimacy uh, uh, that small states bring to the council. I mean, Laurie mentioned that you know, it is a very important thing that um, there are substantial differences around the interpretation of international law, not just amongst, uh, amongst small states, but amongst the larger membership. Everybody uh, in, some, in some form will defend international um, law. And it's, you know, it's comforting to, from the outside, to sort of think of law as a subjective standard that can be evenly applied to all, all cases. But that uh, elides the tremendous amount of politics that is involved in, inter in an international law. Um, so that's something to to be kept in mind. But what you what you see again and again in how small states approach international law in the uh, international environment is this commitment to it as um, fundamental to their status in the inter international system, um, because of because of one is this question of its existential nature that small states are. Uh, con particularly vulnerable or would be particularly vulnerable in a system that uh, if, if international law, the system of international law would be compromised. And also because international law gives them the status as sovereign equals within, uh, within the larger multilateral system. And that is something that they need to have through law rather than through uh, hard power. Um, and that status as, uh, as sovereign equals as the majority of UN member states, I think 
uh, brings a certain amount of uh, uh, special legitimacy, if, if I can say, although that's probably a terrible thing to say in a legal context, because that would have some sort of legal, but politically, um, when they're on the council, they have, uh, um, have a greater um, uh, sort of um, right to reference the wider membership. Um, and I think 2286 is a good example of this, that you had 85 member states uh, uh, joining for this resolution. And that provides, I think, uh, a, a special legitimacy that the council, frankly, needs. Uh, because I think a lot of people look at the council and its uh, um, dominance by the P5 as um, uh, undermining its status as, as, a, as a, a legitimate um, body. So that's important, and that I think maybe, uh, again, to come back to this, uh, this idea of a necessary voice, this is why I think small states have a very important role to play. Great, thank you. Lori. Just very briefly, um, I mean, the first question that was raised was a very important one, another existential one. So what do small states do if they get different messages from different camps, what to do, how to behave? And this is, this is a very tough one, right? And uh, our diplomatic representative already thanked for it. I think historians ponder on these questions, what do small states do on such such occasions and, and huge volumes have been produced with it and I think even such a benevolent form of international law as the United Nations cannot completely take those dilemmas away. Even, even within, the, within the framework of international law there will remain certain different interests. There are slightly different views, for example, in the Western Alliance nowadays. We had that already in the Iraq, during the Iraq War 2003 when France and Germany disagreed with the United States and, and this creates interesting dilemmas for, for small states. And, and I think the answer in, in some ways, it doesn't solve all the problems, but it's, it's in one way it's, it's simple that when you have this, your, your friends or diff, various major stakeholders in the international community pushing the thing in a different direction than you know one thing that the small state can do it can never compete with them maybe in raw power but it can to somehow be in their hearts and minds faith faithful to those to this idea so let's let's agree what the original well, let, let's read what the original compact says international law is there in the un charter most of the answers are there it's 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 sometimes tempting to bypass some of these rules, but I think small states would 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 do wisely if they would would in some ways you know sometimes even remember their their maybe more populous friends that we all need to take the UN Charter very seriously. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, I would just conclude by observing that I think that there's multiple pressure points in the international legal system. And we've been talking about the Security Council, but in fact, the same conversation happens with regards to treaty negotiations or with regards to um, you know, cases that are brought before international courts and tribunals. And so this is part of a larger question about how states can effect effectively participate in the international legal order. Um, and really how s small states can counterbalance power politics. Uh, but I think that we've seen some very concrete examples today of how we can think about the rules and the rules that are meant to protect um, an equal um, or at least um, a balanced um, international order. Uh, and I think there's also very good examples of situations where small states have been uh, very influential in setting out important norms um, in international uh, law uh, and in creating um, a track record, uh, uh, being authors of test case litigation that really do start to change the values that we embrace. Um, I had one final thought on moral authority, uh, and that is uh, that um, I think that um, where possible, it's important for small states to be consistent on issues that are difficult for them, because there's a way in which there's strength in numbers. As I said earlier, I think, you know, the, the, um, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole in many instances. And so when small states can band together and strategically think ahead uh, two moves down, I think that that actually really does mean that they get more moral in authority to influence other issues that come up on, on the agendas. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. I think they deserve a big applause. And thank you all for coming. This has been a great event and a great discussion. Thank you so much.